privilege of getting to say uh, say that you are a father tonight. I know tonight, you know, just like Mother's Day, it's one of those nights that comes with all kinds of different emotions, all kinds of different things, some things that are good, some things that are bad, some things that are full of joy, and some things that are full of hurt and, and difficulty. And so I want to just take a moment and just acknowledge all of that. And uh, I'm very grateful for you to say yes to be here tonight, um, at this time right now, to hear the good news that we get from God the Father. Um, you know, this Father's Day... Um, uh, I kind of was, I don't know, Rachel and I, we were talking, and um, and she approached me. We've been talking for some time now about a, uh, something that I was was hoping to do at some point in my life. And um, and this Father's Day, she, or this week, last week actually, she walked up to me and she said, Hey, so this year for Father's Day, why don't you let us get you a tattoo? Yeah. And uh, and so so I so I, I walked over and I was looking at her and I said absolutely let's do it you know and I was very excited about it I was all pumped up and everything and and I and and started talking so anytime we kind of make a big decision to me that's a really big decision so anytime we make a big decision um, you know we always bring our kiddos in and we kind of say sit down and have a family powwow and a family chat. And we kind of say, okay, so what do you think about this? And so Rachel, you know, she took the lead on this conversation. She says to my girl, she says, okay, so what do you guys think about getting daddy a tattoo for Father's Day? Woo. And you would have thought that perhaps maybe she said, what do you think if we chopped daddy's head off for Father's Day? <laughs> I mean, there were tears. And there was, there was like a resounding, no! You know, I mean, there was all of that. I mean, it was, it was hard. I mean, and my girls, they just, there was just something in them that erupted. And you know, the, the thing is that to be truthful, this is not the first time we've had this conversation. And, uh, and so my girls, they were just, just no, no, no. Now I will tell you that over time, they, they kind of softened a little bit. And we just, as we talked it out, kind of what that meant and all those kind of things, we talked it out. But, you know, I've thought through their reaction a whole lot since then. I've thought through their reaction for a long time now, actually. I thought, man, why, why is it that this reaction is so strong? What's going on inside of them? And guys, I'll tell you, you know, there's purpose in everything. There's purpose in all, I mean, just all kinds of things. The way that our children respond to us, the way that our children act towards us, the way we are towards our children. There's great purpose in, in all of this. And as I, as I was thinking through this, I just began thinking, okay, you know, anything that happens to me, like anything that, that goes on that changes how my girls see me, it's not okay to them. You know, not only my girls, but sincere even. You know, you guys remember that several months ago I had a beard. And well, one day, you know, a few weeks ago, I, I came out with no beard. And uh, I just I just went from one day, had a full beard, to the next day I just got rid of it. And I walked out in my, my, little, my little man, sincere. I walk out, and he just looks at me with these those big old brown eyes. He just looks at me, and he's like, and then I said, hey, buddy, how you doing? And he heard my voice, and you can see it soften. He goes, daddy. <laughs> he didn't even recognize me, and it freaked him out because there was this strange man in his house. And so anything that I've ever done, actually, in the history of me being a father, anything that I've ever done that changes how my kids see me, in my daughter's words, that's totes not cool. Totes not cool. If you're not using that phrase, you need to start using it. <laughs> so you can be totes cool. So I'm just saying, it is, it is really not okay. Now, after thinking through this, you know, I, 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 I just thought through, why in the world is this, this? And I've got to believe that at the root of why this reaction is so strong that way, at the root of this is that it comes from an innate understanding of God the Father who is never changing. 
And we serve a God who is the same yesterday, the same today, and the same tomorrow. And what that does is it establishes a security for each and every one of us that we know that we have a firm foundation. We also know, moms and dads, no pressure, but you guys are setting the tone for how your kiddos see God. Every single day of your life, you are the best example and how you show love to them is the way they believe God loves them. The way that you respond whenever they mess up. The way that you respond whenever they do well. The way that you respond in all of those different... That is setting an example for how they see God. And the thing is, is that if we are constantly changing, and if we are constantly changing, whether it's appearance or whether it's, you know... Um, the way that we act, the way we discipline, the way that we, and we, we have a lack of consistency, what this does is it confuses the truth about God the Father. And so I'm grateful for my daughters. I'm grateful for their reaction. I'm grateful for the conversations that we have for two weeks um, about this. Very, very good uh, conversations. And so um, tonight you heard my oldest read Psalm 136. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful passage of scripture. And uh, I want you guys to read this with me, okay? So read this here. It says, give thanks to the Lord. Okay, we'll try this again. We're going to say this together. With me means together. Okay, here we go. You ready? Here we go. Let's read it together. We group words together as a sentence read left to right. Okay, everybody ready? Here we go. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His Love endures forever. Good. So, so Hesed, everybody say that with me. You're going to spit on the person next to you as you say this. All right? You're going to Hesed. All right. That's it. So that's our word here for the day. Hesed. Now, this word here is very important. Some of you guys have heard me talk about this before. This is one of the words that is that, that carries the most study about it in all of the Bible. In the entire Bible. There are entire books written on this one word. Because our English language cannot capture what that word actually means. It has a very difficult time with this. And this word, in and of itself, specifically, means unconditional love. It's probably the best way we can say it. But actually, perhaps, even a better way for us to understand it. Because love is one of those things in our culture that we struggle understanding. We struggle understanding what the definition of love is. And so, perhaps, maybe the greatest word that we can use for this word in our language is loyalty. His loyalty endures forever. And with that, this word carries a duality. It carries both his towards us and ours towards him. And so there's this loyalty that, that he has for us that no matter what happens in our life, no matter what we do, no matter what we don't do, no matter what's going on, he is loyal to us forever. And consequently, what he longs for is us to respond in that same way because his loyalty is what is actually driving us. Here's the challenge though, guys. The challenge is this can be really hard to grasp. This can be really hard to grasp. This unconditional love, this loyalty can be really hard to grasp because of one big roadblock. One big roadblock. And today, tonight, there are many of you guys that are here and you are continually struggling with guilt, with condemnation, with shame. Now, there's no doubt that some of that is a result of your choices. Some of that is a result of the, 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 of the poor choices that have been made, and, and so therefore you're carrying some of that with you. However, mostly that is carried because of how your father showed you love. Can you believe that? Whether he was non-existent, whether he was existent every single day, the way you handle guilt, shame, condemnation, struggle, all those things is directly connected with how your Father showed you love. And so tonight, tonight I really hope that through Jesus Christ, you guys are able to be set free to live a life that is immovable by anyone other than the Father God. That through Jesus we are able to live this life that is immovable by anybody other than the perfect Father. The Father God. Tonight I have this extended video. It's going to take 11 minutes. This is a very powerful video so you guys tune in. Okay. It's called the Father Effect. So you guys check this out.
2009, I started a journey to find forgiveness for my father. I had no way of knowing how it would change my life forever. A few years ago, I was playing golf with a friend of mine, and I was sharing with him some of the struggles and trials I was going through at the time. And at one point he turned to me and he said, you grew up without a father, didn't you? And I said, yes. And I went on to give him this great 10 minute explanation about how incredible my mom is. As soon as I finished, he turned to me and he said, but was she a dad? It was at that point that I really began to understand the significant and lifelong impact of growing up without a father. My friend went on to explain the idea of a father wound. He said that many people are wounded by their dads because of their dad's words or actions. Maybe it's a girl who's become promiscuous, never hearing the words I love you from her father. She's willing to do anything to hear them from a man. Maybe it's a son who feels angry, unworthy, or ashamed because of a dad who is physically or verbally abusive, which leads the son into an addiction to cover up the pain. For 30 years, I thought I was the only one struggling with this issue and that I was all alone. As I began to share my story, I soon came to understand that there are millions of people suffering from a father wound. And I discovered the absent father epidemic, which was much bigger than I ever imagined. Either physically or emotionally, an absent father has a profound effect on a son or a daughter. A lack of words, a lack of affirmation can, can be a curse. Um, when a dad's not there, what he's actually saying to you, that you hear loud and clear, even if he never says it, is you're not worth it to me to be here. You're not worth it to me to be here. Having a dad kind of excluded me really believing in anything, believing in anything bigger than me. Left unhealed, the father wound is carried into adulthood and can last a lifetime. If you could say one thing to your father right now, what would it be? <sighs> Why couldn't you uh, tell me you love me? Because I grew up with a father who was violent and angry and unpredictable, who was scary. I thought God was the same way. Because I grew up with a father who was to be feared, I thought God was to be feared. My decisions became fear-based. Marriage, because I was afraid to be alone. I wish that my father could have loved his children more than his love of gambling. Because no matter how much he maybe did love us or said he loved us, obviously his addiction to gambling meant more to him. It was related to the abandonment. It was related to the sense that I took on as damaged goods. Okay, if my dad isn't here caring for me, there's something inherently wrong with me. So I took that with me into the beginning of addiction. I can honestly tell you, I don't remember a time early on that I was doing it for party's sake. The instant that it hit my system, I was like, I'm home. I don't feel nothing but good. And all those voices and all that inadequacy, all the shame, all the 
invisibility, all those things were gone. They were gone. Because my dad chose to abandon me, I was very bitter, angry, and resentful. And it was impacting every aspect of my life. Well, men struggle like being good fathers because they don't know what a good father is supposed to be. They haven't been taught. Um, you can only give what you have. And so most of us as men, not having been taught properly, just do what we kind of think is right. It seems kind of right, but not sure if it's right, but well, heck with it. I don't have time to do anything else. Let's do this. My dad never knew how to be a, a father. He never knew how to be a man. Um, his father was killed uh, when he was two, um, so he wasn't there. And his stepfather um, died not too long um, after he married my grandmother. Um, uh, and my dad just really never had a chance. Um, he never had a father figure there. As I began to understand and hear more stories about my dad, his life, and the way he grew up, God revealed one question to me. How could I be so angry, resentful, and bitter towards a man who didn't know how to be a father? God showed me forgiveness for my dad, and it was because of that forgiveness that I finally became the man, the husband, and the dad that God meant for me to be. I get to the hospital bed, and my dad is completely passed out. And I grabbed his hand. I knew I needed to say it then, and I couldn't even repeat the words that I said. I just know that I, it was full of love and forgiveness and, and wishing him the best. And when I turned around, the nurse had walked into the room while I was talking to my dad, and she was just full of tears. And she said, I, I just didn't want to interrupt you to tell you that he passed away an hour earlier. And I said, you know what? I didn't do that for him. I did that for me, and, uh, and I did. It was important for me to truly forgive him in my heart. It's the best thing I've ever done. If you could say one thing to him right now, I forgive you. I said to myself, I forgive you. And I did it from the heart. And then I asked God to forgive me for even thinking that way, you know. All those years, all those years of resentment were gone. The more I talk to others about their fathers, the good and the bad, the more I came to understand how I could become a better father. What is the worst thing a father can do for his children? Ignore them. Abandon them. Treat them as someone who doesn't matter. And that child perceives that he doesn't matter unless he gets personalized, one-on-one, -on -one, independent, uninterrupted time with dad. I, I think fathers make a mistake when they assume that things will be a good substitute for themselves. So when a dad says, I know, I know I'm working extra hard, but I'm trying to provide good things for you and the kids. I don't know of a kid that would say, oh, dad, please work harder. Don't, don't come to the ball games. Don't spend any time with me. Uh, but, you know, make lots of money so that I can have everything that I want. If it comes right down to it, they'd rather have you than they would all the stuff. They'd rather have you at their ball game. They'd rather have, have you eat dinner with them. They'd rather have you put them to bed at night. What do you think is the best thing a father can do for his children? Be a man of God. You know, honestly, uh, you can get into the to the accolades of, you know, encouraging your kids and things of that nature. But, you know, I want to be the man that God's called me to be in front of my son. And when I am that man, I walk in a, in a strength and in a presence that I could never accomplish on my own. I have no problem going into my son's room and saying, I just want you to know I messed up. You know, I got angry with you about such and such, and would you forgive me for that? And uh, man, that just means the world to him. 
as children are constructing their understanding of the world, the dads occupy a very central role in that understanding of the world. And their behavior is so critical to giving the child a positive sense of what a good father is and what good male behavior is. The best thing a father can do for his children is love their mother. But for a child to see his father love their mother, something happens in that 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 child receives that, that centers their life. And my dad was not perfect. He had issues. He struggled with stuff all of his life, and he didn't have a good influence in his life, but essentially my dad broke that chain and, and raised in me. And now, praise God, I'm raising my kids differently. Do not be afraid. Never parent out of fear. Um, you know, love your kid the best you can. Don't try to be perfect. Keep moving forward. You know, make amends, say you're sorry, but try better the next time, because that's all your kids want. But your greatest calling in life, the impact, you're going to make that is greater than any other impact is at home as a dad. There is nothing you can do that will ever make me love you any less. Nothing you can do that will ever make me love you any less. You see, this truth it is the unchanging truth of God the Father's love for us. There's nothing you can do that will make me love you any less. And God the Father loves us unconditionally. He is loyal to us. He has, a, he has a, a white hot passion for us to become who he sees us as. <coughs> Tonight I'm going to be reading out of Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. So perhaps maybe an obscure passage in order to teach something tonight that I believe is at the central truth of what God the Father longs for every one of us in this room to receive tonight. Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation for a little bit more story form so we can, we can understand it maybe a little bit better. Jesus was walking one day through some grain fields with his disciples. It was on the Sabbath, the Jewish day of worship, and his disciples were hungry. So they began breaking off heads of wheat and eating the grain. But some Pharisees saw them do it and protested. Said, your disciples are breaking the law. They are harvesting on the Sabbath. But Jesus said to them, haven't you ever read what King David did when he and his friends were hungry? He went into the temple and ate the special bread permitted to the priests alone. That was breaking the law too. And haven't you ever read in the law of Moses how the priests on duty in the temple may work on the Sabbath? He says, and truly, one is here who is greater than the temple. But if you had known the meaning of this scripture, and here we go, it says, I want you to be, and this word here, loyal, this is that chesed, okay? This is similar to that chesed there, okay? I want you to be loyal. I want you to be merciful. I want you to be unconditionally loving, Right? more than I want your offerings. His point is, if you had known the meaning of that scripture, you would not have condemned those who aren't guilty. For I, the Messiah, am master even of the Sabbath. Okay, so we talk about this, and we read this scripture, because this scripture, I believe, carries the, a great example of the dilemma that we're in, the reality that we live in. Because the questions we have to ask ourselves tonight, especially on this Father's Day, we have to ask ourselves, who are we trying to please? Who is the target of our life? Who are we trying to please? And how are we going about it? Who are we trying to please? And how are we going about it? The answer to these questions, they're most commonly determined by our fathers. I mean, do we have to earn God's love like we did our dad's? Do we have to perform in order to get God to show up like we do our fathers? Does God even care? Does he want to be near me? See, the difference between the values of Jesus and the Pharisees is all the difference in the world. The difference between these two is that the Pharisees believe that the reason God gave them the Bible, the Torah, the reason God gave them the Bible was so that they would strive to keep every single word down to the very last letter. He 
You see, it was all about performance. It was all about doing what the primary goal was, was to do exactly what their Bible said. Now, in and of itself, that's not a bad thing, is it? I mean, we talk about that all the time. The Word of God, we want to do as Scripture says. The problem is, is that they valued the words of a book. They valued the Bible more than they did anything or anyone. You see, the Bible is just a book without the living God. The Bible is just another bestseller without the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus Christ. So if you follow the Bible blindly, you're going to be led astray. You see, the difference is Jesus. Jesus taught something different. He taught something that was of far greater value than simply blindly keeping the words of their Bible. And what Jesus taught was life. He taught how to live. He taught how it wasn't about the do's and don'ts. It wasn't about the it wasn't about the structure in which your behavior is perfect. This isn't what Jesus taught. When Jesus is sitting here saying, God didn't want David and his men to starve because of rules and regulations. When there's all this bread sitting there in the temple. The question is, if we look at our own lives, how many of you are rule followers in here? How many of you push against the rules any chance you get? Absolutely. See, rules are the things that's just crazy. As we look at this, how many of you it would be very difficult to do what David did and to go eat the bread that was in the temple that was known and consecrated only for the priests? How many of you would have a difficult time doing that? Yeah, how many of you would go, dude, I'll munch down on some bread. Let's go get it. Yeah, sure. Isn't that amazing? In the same room, we can have complete opposite realities. And the folks, you guys that are raising your hands, we all are, we, we are pushing hard after following God. Isn't that the most bizarre thing in the world? We're pushing hard after this. Believe it or not, Jesus believed that David was engaged in an act of righteousness in that moment. Now, for us rule followers in the room, I'm one of you. So for us rule followers in the room, I look at that and go, uh-uh. That wasn't righteous. That was sinful. That's what that was. That was downright Sodom and Gomorrah, pit of hell, sinful. They're going to get struck down, burned, lightning bolt to the rear, something. You know? Something's happening like that, right? I know some of you guys are with me. Other folks are like, dude, what's the big deal? The fact of the matter is Jesus believed that he was engaged in an act of righteousness. And in Jewish law, this would be called a mitzvah, which was this would be called a commandment. It was actually a commandment for David to choose the choice that he made. You know why? Because life trumps everything. Life trumps everything. This is not a sin. The fact of the matter is, we tend to be controlled by rules. And we have to be careful of this. Either we're controlled by the fact that we have to push against them, or we're controlled by not being able to think outside of them. The bottom line is, we are controlled by them. What's crazy about it is, just how much... How we look at those things is driven primarily by how we interacted with our fathers. Those things are driven primarily by how we interacted with our dad. If dad was overbearing, you probably tend to push against the rules. If dad tended to be disappointed in you, you may struggle with needing approval from authority figures. And so therefore, rule following is something that comes very natural and is very important if your dad was distant, it could go either way. But there's a reason for it from a distant father. The bottom line is this, and here's something I want us all to make sure that we that we, we really hone in on this tonight. While your father's love was imperfect, good or bad, they did the best they knew how to do. And we need to let we need to let them off the hook at this point. You listen to the to the video a while ago. Something that is critical and something that we need to allow God the Father to do in our lives is allow us to forgive. Because while it was imperfect, he did the best he knew how to do. The chances are he probably did a little bit better than his father did. And hopefully you're doing a little bit better than your father did. Hopefully a lot better, right? And hopefully our kids will carry on and go far greater than we are, right? See, this is the goal. 
crazy thing is, even in your father's absence, they were doing what they thought was best. They were doing what they thought was best. Here's the good news, though. The good news is we can turn loose. The good news is we don't have to hold on to that. God the Father can change everything. He can change everything. And here it is, guys. Our creator God's love is perfect. The perfect Father. God's love never, ever fails. And Jesus gives us in this scripture here, he gives us this foundational truth that's very important for us to grasp. It's very important for us to understand this because this will change everything. Life is the trump card. When God created us and he breathed the breath of life into us, scripture says that he created us very good. Now, guys, this is before you did anything. This is before you, you performed anything. This is before you made any decisions. This is before anything. You were very good. I was very good. The New Testament says that Jesus had come not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And it also says that Jesus has come to give life to the fullest measure. So if we follow the words of Scripture, we kind of take the span of all of Scripture and we condense it down, it gives us an understanding of God's heart. And regardless of how our Father's heart beat, God's heart beats perfectly. And God longs for us to know that he knows us. He knows you. He's pleased with you. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants to be near you. Regardless of what your reality is. Regardless of how you act today. Regardless of how perfect you are regardless of how imperfect you are. He is loyal to you, and he sees you as good. Regardless of how your father saw you, regardless of how you see yourself today, he sees you very good. This is something we take in. This is something we receive. God the Father longs for us to complete the loyalty. He longs for us to know him through Christ. Not only to know that he knows us. Not only to know that he thinks we are very good. He longs for us to know him through Jesus. You see, guys, this is God's perfect love. This is it. So what I want to do tonight, we're almost done. I want to encourage you to close your eyes for just a second. Everybody close your eyes. Tonight, I hope that you can receive these words. Just open up your mind, take a few breaths, breathe deep, and receive this. God is present. God is near. God is loyal to you. God is for you. It doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter what you've not done. There's nothing that you can do that will make him love you any less. And there's also nothing you can do that will make him love you any more. God's love is immovable. He's not waiting for you to mess up. He's not disappointed in you. God is proud of you. He loves you unconditionally, and he longs for you to receive that. He longs for you to let him take what's not good and release you from it. He longs for you to allow him to change your family tree, to release you from where your father may have fallen short, and to fill you with his perfect love and loyalty. No more guilt. No more condemnation. No more shame. Allow God to cover you with his perfect love. The 
perfect father. All right, you can open your eyes. Now, you guys, on this Father's Day, there is nothing more important for us to receive. Nothing. Tonight is not a night for you to feel bad about how well you've done or how, how not well you've done. Tonight is a night about the fact that you are good. You are very good. God sees you that way. We've got to rest and receive that. We don't have to perform. We don't have to be perfect. We exist just the way we are. He loves you. Isn't that nice? The challenge tonight, the challenge for us, and dads, I want to speak to you for just a moment. The challenge tonight is to allow God's loyalty, to allow that truth, those words there that we just received, that we just allowed God to speak into our lives, to then allow those words to flow through our lives. To allow those words not just to rest in and of our souls, to give us peace and rest, but to allow that to flow in and to flow through us to our spouse. To allow that love to flow into our children. To allow that love to flow to the person in the next cubicle. To the person across the hall. To flow in and through us to the person we're going to knock on their door for a business call this week. To flow in and through. The challenge is to be present. The challenge is to be near to be loyal. The challenge is to be for your wife. To be for your children, no matter how either of them or all of them perform. The challenge is for God's love in us to be immovable, steady, strong. And for their families to know and feel that there is nothing they can do that will make you love them any less. Nothing. 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 They don't perform to get your love. Your love is immovable. Just as God's perfect fatherly love is immovable. Now here's the cool part. Kids, wives, give the men in your life the opportunity. Give them a chance. Let them love you like that, and you don't think it's too good to be true, or you throw it back in their face. Let them do this for you. Let them receive from the Father and give to you from the Father. And give them the freedom that they don't perform for you either. It's a two-way street. It's loyalty. Because brides in the room, you're just like us in this room to your husband as we are to God the Father. We in this room are God's bride. And as God longs for us to return his loyalty unto him, your husband longs for your loyalty to be returned to him unconditionally. No matter if he deserves it or not, Here's the cool part. If we do this, if we can all agree to this, to receive this from God and allow his love to pour over us and to fill all of the voids inside of us that are left, all of the challenge that is in us, all of the things we have to overcome, all of the hurt that's layered upon layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, we allow God to begin pulling that hurt away. We begin God to, be, to, to, to take that void where we're afraid of what might could happen if we actually forgive if we were afraid of what might happen, as we, as we allow God to do that, as you dads begin to lean into your families at this level, guess what happens? What will happen is we will then begin to curb the guilt, the condemnation, and the shame in our world. It's not just something that is 
that's freeing for us individually. It's not just something that's freeing for our families. We will begin to curb the guilt, condemnation, and shame all over our globe. And we will begin to raise up a, a new generation that is living a healthy and full life. Don't you want that for your kids? I do. I want my kids to make me look like I'm standing still. I want my kids to blow past me so fast to be so much better mothers. And perhaps if I become a father of a son someday, that, that he becomes a man of God that makes me look like I've been standing still my whole life. Because he's pushing hard. Raising new generations, living a healthy and life that is full of life. Because when we do that, guys, this is the cool part. When we do this, the immovable love of the Father will prevail. And guess what? That makes for the greatest Father's Day ever. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for tonight. I'm so grateful for your hand. I'm so grateful for, for your love. And Lord, I'm so grateful for nights like tonight that we get to receive this. Tonight is the perfect night, Lord, that we get to receive the fact that you look at us and you don't see all of the ways we've failed you. You don't see all of the imperfections. You don't see all of the junk that is loaded on top of what you originally created. You see what you created. You see who you imagined us to be. And you are still pushing hard and encouraging us and challenging us and saying, yes, become who I created you to be. Lord, I pray that you will allow us to turn loose of our control of trying to get our kids to act the right way because we're afraid that they perhaps might embarrass us because we think you're embarrassed of us because our dads perhaps were embarrassed of us Lord let us give all of that over to you and Lord let us receive forgiveness from you and Lord let us give forgiveness to the people that we need to forgive and Lord I pray that Jesus will save us. And consequently, Jesus will save an entire generation. As your word says, unto a thousand generations. Because we say yes to you, and we say yes to a new reality, and therefore our children will never know, and they will never realize the junk we grew up in, or the junk our parents grew up in, or the junk our grandparents grew up in. They're not going to realize those things, because Lord, you have saved us. And out of that, Lord, you set us free. And so, Lord, let us raise our hands and let us raise our voices and let us give to you what is yours. And that is the honor and the glory and the praise that is due your name because, Lord, you are the King of kings and you are the Lord of lords. You are the Father God. You are the perfect Father. And, Lord, you give us the example of what it means for the name Father. And so, Lord, let us rest tonight. And the fact that you see us as good. And then, Lord, let us give our loyalty through Jesus Christ unto you. And live our lives as you created us to live. Without guilt, without shame, without scorn, without condemnation. Because, Lord, you have set us free through your truth. And, Lord, you have come so that we might have life, the trump card of all. You have come so that we might have life, and not just some crappy life, but Lord, we have life to the fullest measure. And Lord, in this we say thank you, and in this we say in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Turn your ear to heaven.